Welcome everyone back. Um, and maybe you were gone this weekend. This was a long weekend, so we do have people coming back from... The thing about Vegas, man, if there is a holiday, people leave. Sometimes they come back. But uh, it's great to have everyone here this morning. Uh, wasn't it a great time in the park last week? I mean, that was great. That was a great time. I know what some of you are thinking. We should do that every week. We would be malnourished on, word of, on the Word of God, and we would be 30 pounds overweight, okay, if we did that every week. That would not be a good thing. But uh, to do it every once in a while is, is a great thing, and just uh, want to thank again all the uh, women and men that uh, were behind the scenes to make it such a great, great time. It was awesome. This is a part two, so to speak, of when we talked about two weeks ago, the next steps and what we wanted to uh, be focused on, not going from one thing to the next, but actually progressing with the thing that God has been doing in this church really for the last two years, if not longer. And that is our relationship with God being the motivation for all that we do. His love for us, our love for him being the source of fuel and the source of inspiration for us to do the things that we do. And we talked two weeks ago about as we clean our house. Was that me or you? Is that me? Oh, great. Uh, as we clean our house, we want to make sure, according to a spiritual principle in Matthew chapter 12, that we fill it full of good things, because if we leave it empty, then the bad things we just got rid of or the spirit that we just got rid of will come back with seven demons worse than what we had in there. And we don't want that. We want to make sure we fill up on God, fill up on his righteousness, fill up on his goodness. And we talked about repentance, reform and refill. So we've we've been having some great talks as was um, alluded to by Emmanuel. Great talks together and people are starting to make connections. And that's awesome. And as we do that, our our obedience will increase, our actions will reform, will, our thinking and our actions will match up to be more righteous and more holy. And then we've got to make sure we're filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit. And all these things are connected one to another. And we talked about Acts chapter 2, the first disciples being devoted, devoted to the word of God, devoted to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And we got a good dose of the fellowship and, and the breaking of bread last week. And really, this was a picture when we revisited Acts chapter two. It was a great picture of people who people's lives who were filled with God and who went on to really, as it says in Acts chapter 17, verse six, in some versions of the Bible, they went on to turn the world upside down. They went on to just affect the world. And it's never been the same ever since. Why? Because the people were devoted to the Lord and they were full of the Holy Spirit. They were full of what God had intended for them to be full of. And that's the kind of people we want to be. We want to be people full of God, full of righteousness, full of holiness, and really with a full of joy to take to the world around us. Amen. This morning, I wanted to connect some dots because how many of you guys remember connect the dots? All right. How many of you were not good at connect the dots? All right. So about three of us. The reason why we're not good at connect the dots is because we think we know what we're making. And so we don't have to follow the numbers anymore. And all of a sudden, you know, one, two, seven, twelve, you know, you're just like, my star looks circle. It looks like a circle. And everybody else's stars look right because they just, all you have to do is follow the numbers. That's the thing about connect the dots. All you have to do is follow the numbers. But if you have ADD, somehow you forget that three comes after two. And all of a sudden you're just like, and you just have to mess up on one number. For the whole thing to be messed up. So I wasn't going to pass out connect the dots for everyone to do. But my insecurity in not being good at that uh, precluded that. So... Just going to have to imagine, connect the dots. I'm one of the guys, I'm one of the ones, kids, how many of you guys like coloring inside the lines? Look at all the old people raise their hand. You aren't kids. You're like, I'm someone's kid. Okay. 
I would color within the lines probably for the first 10 seconds. And then I'm saying, I'm not covering enough space. It's not going fast enough. And so you just start. And I remember my sister, I'm totally off topic here, but I remember my sister used to color and all the strokes would go the right, you know, the same direction. And I'd be like, what magic crayon do you color with to get that, you know? I'm like, my black carry-on just doesn't color that way. All right. Anyway, connect the dots. Now, you say, what dots are we connecting? The dots of that I think God has been moving in in this church and in our lives, I want to make sure we don't see them as separate events, but see them as connected events, really to shape a picture or to form a picture of a disciple of Jesus Christ, okay? And to do that, I wanted to go to a passage of Scripture where... Paul did a great job of connecting some dots, especially for the church or the people in Athens. So in verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, I have you starting in verse 22, but it's verse 16 will give a little bit more background. So while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were, began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? Are you bringing some strange ideas to our ears? And we would like uh, to our ears and we would li- I'm sorry. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Now, I want us to catch something here, and I didn't catch it till this morning. I have this app on my Bible where you can listen to a chapter seven times in a row. Blue Letter Bible. I don't get paid by them, but man, it's one of the best apps that I've found, right? And you can listen to a chapter seven times in a row straight. And I didn't drive long enough to get seven. I think I got three or four in, all right? But think about it. These guys sit, sat here and they listened to idea after idea after idea after idea after idea after idea after idea. And then they listened to more ideas. And when they heard about the resurrection of Jesus, they said, that's a new idea. We have never heard of anything so absurd as someone raising from the dead. Because you have, what did, what did the scripture say? What did Paul say? That the, the cross or the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But the thing that blew me away, I'm thinking they have heard thousands and thousands of ideas. And then when they heard about Jesus in the resurrection, they're like, hey, this is new. This is different. Come speak to us. You could be our special guest. And we want to know about what you are talking about. Now, I don't know about you. I'm an ideas guy. So when you come up and and I believe what uh, it says in Ecclesiastes, everything that was has been done. There's nothing new under the sun. But on that day, there was something new under the sun. And they wanted to hear about it. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see in every way that you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, it's important to understand in about the 6th century B.C., there was, and this is like legend has it, myth has it, right? That there was a guy named Epimenides, a, a, a Cretan philosopher that supposedly went to sleep for 57 years and woke up and everything had changed. And then and he was espoused as this real wise guy and, and some sage of some sort. But anyway, the Athenians won a battle. They mistreated the people they had conquered and a plague descended on Athens. They didn't know what to do. And so they basically, as, as it says, they had 
idols of all the different gods, and they basically appealed to all the gods to remove this plague. And the plague did not lift. So they went to Epimenides and they said, hey, you're a smart guy. Maybe you can come and help us out to deliver us from this this uh, plague because we're, we're just stuck. We, we need an idea. So Epimenides went and he saw everything and he said, well, maybe you're missing a God. Maybe there's a God out there that that you're missing. And and if you can find out which God that is, that you'll appease him. So anyway, they had this idea to in the morning to release sheep, black and white sheep out into the field. And, you know, sheep in the morning. Well, you may not know this because I didn't know this. Sheep in the morning are the hungriest. And they said the sheep that lay down when they should be eating will basically sacrifice them right there and erect altars to the unknown God. Because this will be the unknown God picking his sacrifices that are pleasing to him. And that's what they did. And so. Hundreds of years later, you have altars to what? The unknown God. And so Paul is saying, this God who you don't know that you worship in ignorance, I'm about to tell you who he is. And he goes on. So you see that dot back in the sixth century. Paul's making a connection in the first century. And then he says, Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. The Areopagus, I was there and I stood maybe where Paul stood and you have a picture or you're able to see the uh, Parthenon. And so when Paul is preaching this, preaching this, there are temples that you can see and he's like, yeah, God's not there. God's not at that temple, not at that temple, not at that temple, not at that temple. He's not in temples made by hand. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. See, when you worship an idol, the person who fashions the idol gives life to the idol. And he's trying to get them to connect the dots. You don't bring life to the gods. God, the one and only God, brings life to you. And he goes on in verse 26, from one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and their boundaries of their lands. God did did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any uh, one of us. So he is trying to help the Athenians to understand, hey, you are where you are because God has placed you there. You you have what you have because God has made it so. God is the one who puts people in their place for the express purpose of the hope that they would reach out to God. And now Paul is saying, this unknown God, let me connect it here to the God of heaven. Let me connect it there. He's not a God that you created. He's a God that created you. In fact, he created all men from one man, and that's how you all came into existence. And all of a sudden, all the dots are connected. Verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made from human, by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul did a masterful job of helping the Athenians to connect the dots between God and their existence and Jesus Christ. Before Paul preached to them, all these dots were out there. They did not know how they were connected. Paul connected the dots. In fact, he connected the dots for us to help us to understand that we are where we are because God has placed us there. And he's placed us there with the hope that we would reach out to him. So, let me, does everybody understand that passage of scripture? Okay, because that's important to understand. That's important to get, get, get on straight. And so, 
I love this picture. Because I remember in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, again, in some, uh, some of the older versions and some of the other versions, it talks about these men who, is, who have turned the world upside down had come to uh, Thessalonica. But anyway, I love this picture because I think that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to really turn the world that we exist in upside down. He wants us to bring to the world something that the world doesn't have. A new idea, which to us is an old idea, but the new idea is Jesus in their life and them being disciples. And this is what I believe. God has strategically and supernaturally put you in the place you are so that you could bring Christ to your world and turn it upside down. Now, we talked last week about oikos, right? Your family or extended community that, that, that you inhabit, that all of us have. We all have 8 to 15 or fewer or more people in our lives that, that God has placed us in, in that position because we are strategically and supernaturally placed there and we are uniquely gifted to be in these people's lives with the hope of bringing Christ to them. And we are uniquely and strategically placed in each other's life to help us be the best disciples that we can be. Now, you might not believe this, but it's true whether you believe it or not. You are where you are because God has placed you there. So let's go ahead and connect some dots. And I'm going to try to do it in the vein of of Paul because it's all about Jesus. So this is you. All right. And don't get mad that there's not a female symbol or anything like that. That's just a person. All right. I was... I kid you not, because of the climate we live in, I told my wife, should I have a male figure and a female figure? Should I just have one? Or, Dude, that's you, okay? <laughs> and so, that's you. And what we've been doing as a church, individually and collectively, we've been working on making Jesus Lord of our lives. In every aspect of our lives, we're trying to connect that particular dot. And, you know, to do God justice, that should be the whole page dot. But, you know, for, for practical purposes, I had to make the dot small so it fit on the page. But that's lordship. Jesus is Lord. And we've talked about Jesus being Lord, our relationship with God being the most important thing in our lives. In, 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 in that relationship, understanding God's love for us and in response, out of gratitude, showing the world our love for God through our discipleship and the lordship over our lives. And we talked about Jesus being the Lord of our life when it comes to the body of Christ. That we are, are making sure that we're building each other up as the Lord has commanded us, the Lord has expected of us, all the one another passages of Scripture. We talked about our personal physical families, being the best disciple we can be under the lordship of Jesus for our physical families so that our children, our wives, our parents, our our husbands, our relatives can see God at work in our physical families. And then we talked about our neighbors. And this really encompasses everybody who's not part of the church, everybody who's not part of our family. It's everybody else. They're our neighbors. And that's inclusive of the body of Christ and our family. We're, they're all our neighbors. And we are the best disciples that we can be under the lordship of Jesus so that we can take Christ to our neighbors. It's all connected. So let's talk about this next dot. There's us again. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. Now I want to talk about the oikos. Okay, our oikos, our oikos is basically the people in our lives that we see on a regular basis. Okay, you could think right now, outside of these people in, in the church, you could probably think about three, four, eight, ten, fifteen people. We did this with the men, and people were able to put down eight, ten people that you see at least once in a week. On a regular basis, whether they be co-workers or family or friends or neighbors or whatnot, that's our oikos. And we are connected because we are at the center of that oikos. 
And that's made up of our relatives. That includes our, our spouse. That includes our children. Okay? That includes aunts, uncles, everybody. And our friends. Some of us have many friends. Some of us have a few friends. Okay? But we have friends. Our co-workers. Our schoolmates. Our neighbors. And I put other. Now, you say, well, what's other? Other would be those people that you might just run into at the gas station. And, they, and they're in the other category because they're not, you know, they're not necessarily fit perfectly in those. I think they would all fit under neighbor, but maybe they're, they don't live close by or whatnot. And they're other. But let me, let me make sure you understand this. Nobody stays in other if you have a relationship with them. They will eventually move to friend. They might be a schoolmate, relative. They might be something, but they don't stay other. You don't, you don't want to stay other. What category are you other? But that person you meet, that you reach out to, you build a friendship with them. You study the Bible with them. They didn't become a disciple from other. They usually become a disciple from friend. Because, see, there's this mindset that God doesn't work through the oikos all the time. But I'm convinced he works through the oikos all the time because the people that we help bring to Christ usually are our friends. It's a very rare instance where you meet someone, study the Bible right there, and they become a disciple right then and there. Okay, the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, it's sort of like it doesn't happen all the time, right? Here's water. Why, why can't I be baptized? It, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But most of the time, people who become Christians come from one of those categories. Someone may start here, but they'll eventually move into the other ones. Okay, that's our oikos. And it's connected. Does that make sense? So now, if we stay true to our teaching and our training and our church culture, we say, great, those are two separate ideas. Which one should we do? Should we do the Lordship one or should we do the Oikos one? Well, I want to submit to you that you have Lordship and everything derives from our relationship with God. And it bleeds into or connected to the oikos, our oikos, your oikos, and all the things that surround it. Okay? All of them. All that is connected. How is it connected? Well, the thing that connects it is our relationship with God. And we're connected to our oikos. And by being the best disciples that we can be, we influence all these people. Does it make sense? So you say, well, if I'm not great on this, make the connection. How great are you going to be on this? If I'm doing great on this, you're fired up about this. When you're struggling in this. Sometimes we want to hide our struggles. But guess what? Guess what all these people might be going through? Same struggle. So as you struggle in this and you fight through and you overcome, guess what you show all of this? You show God's power and love and the Holy Spirit at work in someone's life. All of a sudden, God becomes real to the people. Because it's real through you. And each of us are a part of God's church. Now think about it this way. The way we typically see church is we all come together and there's a bunch of dots, right? Bunch of dots all around. And we come together, about 200 of us, and we come together on a Sunday and then we all leave. Now I want to think about it a different way. Now if we take this seriously, we understand that we are always connected to Jesus. We are always living under his lordship. Whether we come to church or don't come to church, you know, whether it be a Sunday or a Wednesday or a Friday, we're always connected to the Lord. If we're always connected to the Lord, that means wherever we go, we are connected to this. 
So instead of 200 people coming to church on Sunday, when these 200 people leave, that's like 200 people going to affect, let's say five because of my math. What's five times 200? Thousand, thank you. That means a thousand people. You take what you, you take what you learn from church and you take it to a thousand people collectively. That means from a Sunday service where you get inspired, you get instructed, you get equipped, you take that now to your eight to 15 people and everybody does it. You've got a lot of people impacted all of a sudden in a week. You do this month after month, year after year. Now you say, well, what if they don't become Christians all of, you know, very quickly? Well, everybody knows life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. There are going to be some people that run it fast, some people that run it a little slower. But I guarantee you, if someone of your 8 to 15 became a Christian, you'd be fired up. If someone of, of the 8 to 15 grows in their relationship with God, because we're in each other's oikos. If Ed is in my oikos and he becomes closer to God and I become closer to God, we're grateful to be in each other's life. But here's where the rubber meets the road. Is some of us, where we are, is our whole oikos is filled with people that go to church. Because we don't have a lot of friends outside of church. Because we've kind of gotten into this mindset where we're going to be a holy huddle. And we don't spend a lot of time with people outside the holy huddle. Well, what happens? Well, then that becomes only one extension. And that one extension is all Christians. Now, that's not a bad thing in terms of that the Christians, you're impacting them and you're helping them. But we're out there to seek and save what? The lost. See, when we're connected with Jesus as Lord, we love what he loves. We, we value what he values. We're about what he's about. And what is he about? He's about saving people in our oikos. All of them. And so I want us to think we could swing the pendulum the other way, right? The other way is, well, then I'm not going to have any Christians in my oikos so that I can go save everybody. Well, the problem with that then is who are you strengthening and who's strengthening you? Who's preparing you and encouraging you for the work in your oikos? So instead of being all the way over here where we have a holy huddle. And instead of being all the way over here, we're out just a friend of sinners and we have no Christian friends. How about we have right in the middle? Now I'm, I'm kind of right in the way, right? Right in the middle. And you start understanding why is my coworker in my life? She's not just there to annoy me. Yeah, you laugh. That's that nervous laughter. How does he know where I work? Okay. <laughs> How does he know my coworker? But think about it. They're probably thinking the same thing about you. All right. They're not just there to annoy each other or to just be chummy. Chum. You're there to take Jesus to them. When you go to school, that person you're sitting by should be in your oikos. Especially if you sit with them day after day, week after week, month after month. I shared with the guys, um, there was a Mike, where's Mike? Mike who beats me in bowling more than I beat him in bowling. We, we on Tuesday mornings, we've just started this thing. Uh, Mike, myself, and Andrew, his son, we just started this like Tuesday breakfast and bowling, right? And um, it's awesome. It's fun. Um, and I would encourage you to do this as well, not just breakfast and bowling, but set up some times outside of Sundays, outside of midweeks to have fellowship, but to do some fun things. Because when you're out having fun, you actually bump into other people having fun. And what, guess what you expand? Your oikos. So we're out there bowling and we're getting ready to bowl. And I shared this with the men. And, and there's this guy off to the side who's, who's kind of watching us. And he just finished bowling. And, and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to beat Mike today. I'm going to beat Mike and Andrew today. And this guy's watching. And, and we're, we're starting to get ready to bowl. And, and it dawns on me. It's like, man, this guy. Talk to this guy. He's not just there to interfere with your bowling. 
He actually might be there because God wants him in your oikos. Right now, he'd probably be other. Or neighbor. Because he was next to me in the bowling thing. (laughs) And we're starting, and all of a sudden, we start talking. All three of us start talking, and we just start talking. talking. We we talk about church, we talk about his life, we talk about all, and we just start talking, 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 talking. talking. We may have another friend joining us for, for breakfast and bowling. How awesome is that? But even if he doesn't, for me, I'll share for me, personally, that was a victory. Why? Because I tend to hyper-focus on things. I am there to get milk. Yes, eight people said hi to me, but I am there to get milk. Don't get in my way. Stop talking to me. I got to go get milk. Almond milk, because we don't drink cow milk. I know what some of you are thinking, don't drink milk, it's bad for you. Okay. Some of us, we're hyper-focused. We actually think we're at the gas station, or we're at the job, or at school, or at this, or at that, because we're there to just do that thing. How many of you has ever gone to the store and run into someone that you knew? We, we do, my son does track and, and he just participated in this every 15 minutes. Some of you know about it, this program or whatever. And we got to meet a ton of friends. Guess what happened to our oikos? It just got bigger. You say, Delano, I can't work with more than eight people. Amen. Delano, I've got to work with at least 20. Amen. But what do you do with this? We're going to talk about that probably next week. We're not going to talk about it this week. But the point is I wanted to make is it's connected. And who is at work? Lord. He does the heavy lifting, guys. Why do I say that? Let's connect the dots. You live as a disciple under the lordship of Jesus because of your love for him. Therefore, God has strategically and supernaturally put you in your oikos so that you could bring Christ to all the people in it. Are you getting the connection? So now you start, oh, someone set their alarm. How many? 30 minutes? It's been 30 minutes. Sorry about that. (laughs) Hit snooze on that for me. All right, give me another nine minutes. So I want you to think, why read your Bible? Why, why, Why read and study your Bible? Okay, to know the word? To be what? To be better equipped to help others. I don't know who said that. Oh, I kind of do. She is the most beautiful woman in this building. She has awesome taste in men and she's beautiful. (laughs) To better be equipped, not only for ourselves, but what does it, what did the Bible say? It says that, the, the word of God is living and active, right? It, it's there, divides soul and spirit. The word of God is useful for teaching, training. It's useful for rebuking and correcting so that the man of God may be what? Through it equipped. We, we read the Bible, yes, to know God's word, but there's a purpose behind it to be equipped to help the people in our oikos. Now, why pray? Why pray? Connection to who? Connection to God. And who are we praying for? You said myself. Okay, yes. That's one of the dots. But you start praying every day for the people in your oikos. Why do we work as unto the Lord at our jobs? To the glory of God. Who sees your work? Your oikos. Why be a great student? Why be the best student you can be at, at, in school? Why, 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 why be honest on a test and not cheat on a test? Why do these things? Because your oikos sees you. See, that's the thing about your oikos, guys. Here's the thing. Let me get back to it real quick. 
Here's the thing about your oikos. They see this or they don't see that in your life because it's connected. Why be the best disciple you can be is because you want to be in the best position you can be through God to take Christ to the people, to see God's love and power and grace. Will you be perfect? That's not what God asks you to do is to to be perfect in your oikos. Now, yes, there's that passage of the scripture, be perfect as your father, heavenly father is perfect. But read it in context. Because he was talking about love. God's perfect love. Anyway, so do you see? Does everybody make that connection? It's not a program, guys. That's our other culture and our other training. Okay, so we'll do this for six months, then we'll move on to something else. How can you ever get away from this? When, when do you get away from this? Maybe when you retire to a desert island and you're the only one on that island. Since that's not going to happen to all of us, it doesn't go away. It's not a program. It is who you are. All right. So. I did this already and I'm over my time. So let's take communion together. Now, remind me, because I have a bad memory to to talk about uh, what to do with the oikos later. Okay, and I think I asked you guys to remind me about us to tell you a story about priority. Keep reminding me about that because I kind of forget it during the week. All right. It says the son is the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter one, verse 15 through 23. The firstborn over all creation for in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, all the dots have been created through him and for him. There's not one thing that's created that's not for Jesus Christ. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you, connected you. He has brought you into right standing, reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This particular passage of Scripture is full of connections. Paul does another, another wonderful job of connecting the dots. And all the dots are connected to Christ. And all the dots are able to be saved because of what he did on the cross. As we take communion this morning, I want us to think about our oikos. I want us to think about our lordship. I want you to think about your connection to Jesus. And to really understand you are strategically and supernaturally placed where you are. So that because he believes that you are the best one to reach your oikos with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And it's because of that gospel message we can have a relationship with God the Father. And know that one day we will be with him in heaven. Let's go to God in a word of prayer as we take communion together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your grace and your patience and your kindness. Father, we ask as we take communion together that you will bless us, keep us, guide us, and lead us. Help us, Lord, to be the best example that we can be, Lord, not for our glory, but for your glory. And not do it out of duty, but do it out of love, out of gratitude for how you have loved us, how you've had grace in our lives, how you have have had patience. We thank you for this time. We thank you for Jesus and him crucified. But we thank you especially for him resurrected. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.